Good morning, everyone. Um, so I think we can begin. Looks like we have a few guests. So Mike, um, I'll hand over to you. Yep. Thank you very much, Marta, um, and uh, congratulations for pulling together this uh, this fabulous event today. Uh, good afternoon, everybody from from Imperial College uh, in in London. It's my pleasure today to host uh, this event um, to mark International uh, Day of Education, um, which was which was yesterday. Uh, my name's Mike Tennant. I'm the Vice Dean of Education in the Faculty of Natural Sciences at in Imperial. And um, today we have some fabulous uh, panelists, uh, Ana Gomez from uh, Portugal, Wealth Okati from Nigeria, and Daniel Glaser from the Royal Institute down uh, just down the road um, uh, in, in London. Um, so, so, so a few words um, before we start. Um, the, the International Day of Education um, is UNESCO's um, initiative to, 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 to mark um, SDG 4, Sustainable Development Goal number four, uh, which is related to inclusive um, and equitable education. And um, today we're going to be discussing um, that in the context of innovative um, uh, methods to actually raise awareness and engagement uh, in science uh, from the public. Um, if we consider the number of people across the world who don't have access to education, um, then we need innovative approaches um, and exclusive approaches um, to to help them um, to help them to educate um, and raise that uh, uh, awareness. Um, so our panelists are going to be talking um, uh, about that and then taking some specific questions. Um, I do have to say that this year's International Day of Education education um, has been dedicated to the girls and women in Afghanistan who have been denied education um, by the repressive uh, regime um, over there. Um, so um, with that, um, I'm going to introduce the um, the, the, the speakers. Um, Anna Gomez um, runs the managing um, uh, uh, director of Pint of Science in Portugal. She's a biologist um, by training and a science communicator and has done um, uh, some significant outreach work in science and, science and health working in cancer prevention. Uh, Wealth Okete is the co-founder of the Science Cafe in Nigeria. He's a biochemist and an immunologist and has developed um, other podcasts, in particular Immunology in Africa. And Daniel Glaser is the Director of Science Engagement at the Royal Institution and um, has done um, engagement all around the world, um, including um, UK, India, Thailand, Kenya and South Africa. So welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming along. Um, uh, I'd like to invite um, you each to give a three minute um, introduction um, to uh, Science Cafes, um, starting with Anna. Hello, good morning everyone. Um, let me just wait a minute to share my screen and my presentation with you. Are you seeing my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. Thank you. So first of all, uh, thanks again to Martha for inviting me uh, to be here speaking uh, on uh, this topic, Science Cafes. I will be here sharing with you my experience um, with Pint of Science Portugal. But first I will go through uh, my academic journey with you so you can understand uh, how I came into science communication. So um, I started uh, my degree, my biology degree in 2016, and I always loved the lab and immunobiology. So I was always looking for opportunities and internships um, that, gave, that would, gave me, would, would give me uh, experience uh, in the lab. So in 2019, I uh, finished my degree and immediately started my master's in oncology at the Portuguese Institute of Oncology. Um, at that point, I was convinced that I was going to be a researcher and a scientist in oncology. 
but then I had uh, some classes that allowed me to have contact with um, patients living with the disease and got to understand how little they knew about the, their own condition and how that had an, an impactful, um, how, how impactful that was on their general health and how they were um, uh, and their quality of life. So I had the opportunity to, in 2020, have an internship with Psycho-Oncology Unit at IPO. Um, and there I was researching and writing about the benefits of um, having higher uh, health literacy levels and how that impacts a patient's um, coping mechanisms with the disease and how impactful that was in the outcome, in the health outcome. Uh, so at that moment, I decided to switch the lab with the communications room and uh, switch it to um, a science communication masters. So I finished the first year of the oncology masters and then switched to science communication. Um, in the in 2021, later in 2021, I had the opportunity to join a Pint of Science team in Braga. Um, and at the same time, I started my internship uh, in a cancer prevention unit at Ipatimup, where is, uh, which is where I currently work as a health communicator. And um, last year, I had the amazing opportunity to join the national team of Point of Science Portugal. And uh, together with uh, Beatriz, I am uh, managing communications. And I hopefully today... That, I will be talking about Pint of Science Portugal and about our project and hopefully will inspire you to, uh, in May, be toasting to science uh, in the festival uh, in your countries. And that's it. This is my team. <laughs> Hope uh, I will enjoy you today in the, later in the discussion. Lovely. Thank you very much, Anna. And um, perfect timekeeping, I must say. Uh, so um, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Wealth now. So Wealth, thanks very much for coming in from Nigeria and, um, and over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon from Nigeria. So my slides will be coming up soon. Yep. Yeah, so I am Welt Okete. I'm a biochemist from Nigeria and um, I took an interest in science communication shortly after I graduated from the university. So I really didn't know anything about Psycom until um, I left school. So it really was something interesting and I felt I could like jump into it. So long story cut short, I um, wrote for newspapers and um, somewhere along the line, I, I um, co-founded the a community science community science cafe in 2020 alongside um other uh, biochemists who also have interest in you know discussing science scientific research and you know promoting science so i'll just be sharing um some of the things we've been doing to uh, promote science education to science cafe next slide so um science cafe is basically um, does not is not the conventional um, science cafes that people are quite familiar with, where you you know speak with, you no know, go to the public and just engage with members of the public. So it's um, more um, all encompassing. So what we do in science cafe, um, we basically are a community of bioscientists and individuals with interest in bioscience, undergrads, graduates, and all of that. So we we meet together and we discuss about science scientific research and we discuss about our interest, we discuss trending issues and I think the very interesting part of our, most of our meetings is that they are open to members of the public so anyone at all, whether or not you're a scientist but you have interest in you in science, you want to learn more about science, you are open, you are allowed to join our meetings. So the why, why did we start Science Cafe? So we wanted it to be a forum for knowledge sharing, discussions and all of that so where people could come up and meet and talk about science, learn from each other and explore different areas of science and um, keep up with science that is evolving. So we were also looking at it being a medium for people to gain skills. So particularly individuals who are members of the community, communication skills and also um, other soft skills and 
maybe skills that can propel them in their career. Yeah. So we also concerned about networking and collaboration between members of the and who are out of school or in school or in grad schools, you know, collaborate and explore the world of science together. So um, we are also looking at outreach. So although uh, initially when we started the community, it was, it was more of just maybe an indoor community where people could just meet and discuss about science. But as we evolved, we realized that the need to talk about what we do to talk about science to the outside world was something really pertinent. So we we kind of incorporated that into uh, our operations, as you see from the um, the next slide soon. So we're also looking at growth. So growth is um, a very, very important aspect of life. So both as scientists on our as, as a non-scientist if you're gaining skills you are gaining knowledge um growth is the you know the end outcome of it all so growth was also something we are um, passionate or concerned about um while we're starting our science cafe so some of the things we do in science cafe we uh, participate in we hold open forums so these are like open discussions where we uh, address pending issues in science or sometimes controversial issues like ethics ethics and in, in our community so um, they are usually rich I would like to say that's my hard timer kicking in, but I think it's more of a network fault than anything else. <laughs> uh, we seem to have lost wealth there. Um, oh, that's a shame. I, 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 I really love to. Ah, wealth, you're back. OK, can you hear me now? Uh, we can. Um, maybe you just want to spend 15 seconds wrapping up um, so we can so, so, so we can move on. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So um, we uh, so basically we do open discussions and presentations and um, we're also looking at um, more outreaches. We've done a few online and campaigns to promote science and just promote science education and communication. Yeah, thank you very much. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much. And I, I, I particularly enjoyed your uh, description, exploring the world of science together. So, so thank you for that. Um, so over to you, Daniel, from the Royal Institute. Hello there. Yes, so I'm Daniel Blazer from the Royal Institution. I'm a neuroscientist uh, by background, um, uh, but kind of gave up doing active research uh, a little while ago and have been really interested in spaces where scientists and non-scientists can engage. And I first encountered the Café Scientifique model, as it was and is then called uh, in 2002. Um, I was at a thing called the Institute of Contemporary Arts, which is an art space in London, and I was the scientist in residence there. So for me, uh, Café Scientifique fits into this um, interdisciplinary uh, process, which is signalled often by the label on the space that you do things. Uh, as a quick historical note, um, Café Scientifique, by that name, was founded by a guy called Duncan Dallas, who sadly died in, in 2014, was a very good friend of mine. Um, and uh, he founded it in a wine bar across the road from where he lived. He had been a TV science producer, but he was um, quite bored with television because the thing which people in those days did when they watched telly was to sort of sit back on the sofa with their arms crossed. Um, nowadays, of course, they'd be sitting back on the sofa with their arms crossed on their phone as well. Um, and he was interested in the more of a lean forward uh, approach. And I think that lean forward approach, the participative approach is very important. Uh, we don't have participation in the sense that most of your cameras are off, but I will ask you to use the uh, response buttons within uh, Teams to signify if you've ever been to a cafe scientifique anywhere in the world at any time, if you've ever been to one, give us a thumbs up now and we should get a, a drift of those for those who've been. Uh, so we've had a few. Uh, and one of the critical things about the Café Scientifique as a model is that uh, originally it was uh, not held in a science space. So it was held in a space that was owned and controlled by the audience. In Duncan's case, it was a cafe across the road, um, but we've they've been held in um, community meeting spaces, bars, cafes, theatres. We did one in the ICA. The idea is that the scientist is not in control. You take all the things that give a scientist control and you take them away. So in the classical model, 
there's no PowerPoint, there's no microphone, there's no lectern, uh, and you have a facilitator whose job it is to boost the voices of the audience, and in effect almost to keep the scientist a little bit quiet, not to allow her to dominate the space. But, and this is the interesting thing I think for the discussion, Duncan was very keen, and I uh, agree with this principle, that it's a non-legislative idea. So he and I and, and Tom Shakespeare and, and Anne Grand and others who, who keep the Café Scientifique tradition have very clear ideas about what a café should be. No slides, uh, no microphones and so on. But anyone is free to run it any way they want. So if you want to set up a café, so you can do it anywhere. And I will argue passionately with you, ideally over uh, you know, a beverage, uh, about whether what you're doing is the original one or not. But the model it allows that plurality. And I hope in the conversation uh, we can explore that. It, you probably know it's happened in 60 countries uh, around the world without any trademarking. And so that power, I think, is something we should celebrate. Great, thank you, thank you, thank you, Daniel. And again, more more uh, evocative um, uh, uh, language there. I like particularly like the leaning forward um, rather than slobbing with a bag of crisps. So, uh, so um, we, we we have a number of questions that we've set up in advance, but uh, I do invite everybody to um, type questions into the chat. Um, and uh, Marta and the team are collating them, and um, we we hopefully will have some opportunity to ask them later. Um, so the, the the first thing that um, uh, I'm really interested in, though, is how this actually differs from other forms of public engagement. You know, we're, we've got newspapers, we've got popular science mags, um, we've even got TikTok now. I have no idea what TikTok is, but we've got TikTok now. Um, so how, how are um, these, these cafes, how are they different? Um, and, and maybe we'll just go around again. So Anna, maybe you can, you can kick us off with that. Yeah, I think... Um... The main thing is that we are taking scientists to the people, to people. So scientists are getting out of their labs or their uh, rooms where they work. Not not every scientist work, works in a lab, um, and uh, are going out to informal spaces, having a chat, a casual chat about their work and explaining it in um, plain, simple. Um, vocabulary so everyone can understand so I think that's the main thing taking scientists out of the laboratories and uh, where they work to pubs to bars and uh, having them uh, talk with people that are not familiar with their work and want to be familiar with their work because it impacts their everyday life it's knowledge uh, we shouldn't be closing the door on any knowledge. <laughs> And great, basically. great, thank you. And 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 I do invite, um, in in the interest of a free flowing conversation, I invite the other panelists to develop this um, in any way they see fit. So please just just jump in, Wealth or Daniel. Okay, so just to add to what um, Anna has already said, so I think Science Cafe creates that um, informal setting where people can um, discuss science and look at how it affects their life. And I, I think something really interesting, for example, about what we do in Science Cafe is that um, whatever topics or whatever things we are exploring, since ours is a virtual community, we don't really go out to meet people one on one. We, um, we want question that often pops up in our mind is how how does this affect us, um, especially in our local community? So how can we apply this to say Nigeria or how can we apply this to say Africa? And um, what what are the um, benefits or detriments or what are the concerns we should be looking out for if we are going to say um, bring a scientific innovation and say apply it to our local communities or our local settings? So yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely echo what Wealth says, and I know Duncan was very keen to do stuff in Sub-Saharan Africa, and, and there are, you know, I've done myself cafes in, in Uganda and Betty, in, uh, in, in, in Kenya and Betty in Uganda is, is, is still leading a number of these initiatives there, so it's sensitive. If I may, though, I'll just give you a quick run through of the format that we developed in the UK. Again, I want to emphasize that this is not dogmatic, right? I'm going to passionately defend what I'm going to describe, but you should definitely do whatever you want. I, including if it's different, right? But the, the UK format, firstly, uh, we gave it a French name, 
uh, that was important in the UK context because it made it seem a little bit unconventional, uh, a little bit kind of, and, and we can talk about the history of that. Um, it's uh, the general model is that it's free to enter. Uh, so as, as the blurb says, as a you know, for the price of a beer, and it was part of what used to be called a thing called a xerocracy. So Xerox was the photocopying thing. A xerocracy is like a democracy, but it's for anyone who hands out flyers. So you should be able to participate uh, in that way. Um, uh, it was generally in a pub. Again, it has to be culturally sensitive. I know it happens in a lot of countries where alcohol is not uh, part of popular culture and we have to embrace that tradition. But in cultures where alcohol is is uh, allowed, then um, uh, alcohol is very helpful to reduce the barriers to participation. Um, as I said before, the lack of PowerPoint, the lack of microphone means that the speaker doesn't dominate. And in fact, after the sort of 20 minutes initial focus from the speaker, uh, you go straight to a break. Because if you go to the questions, normally it's the usual suspects who come in with their question that they knew they were going to answer before they even arrived, and they're generally the boring ones. And then active facilitation is usually important because people like, you know, they're like, hey, you know, I've often had the audience saying, why do you keep interrupting the speaker? We came here to listen. So you need a facilitator who's confident in saying, no, no, let's let's get some voices from the audience. Let's see if the audience can answer each other's questions uh, and join in that way. And then something quite magical happens when when the audience starts to provide the answers as well as the scientist and the scientist realizes that actually the knowledge can be co-created. Uh, maybe maybe I can take this as an opportunity to remind the attendees, the audience, that they too can submit questions into the chat and uh, and and we can discuss them. But um, maybe and we answer. can take well and answer them. Yes, yeah. Um, maybe we can take this opportunity to focus a little bit deeper and look at the specific differences between the science cafes and and the plethora of other mechanisms we 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 may have. And we've got a great overview here, but. If you could pinpoint the key differences, the key characteristics that, that really make this powerful, what would they be? The informal setting, really. It's the informal setting. Uh, it makes people comfortable. Uh, it make, it puts uh, the audience and the scientists on the same level. And that's very important for people to feel uh, that uh, they can have a voice there and and uh, their uh, questions uh, and doubts about uh, whatever is being presented or uh, chit chat about <laughs> uh, will is also important. Um, feel like they they are also one of our, our own. I don't want to pull it, put it that this way, but just to uh, clarify. Uh, so basically, that's it. The informal setting. Um, that's the main difference. Uh, people feeling comfortable, being there, asking questions. That's it. Daniel, please. Well, I just—it's not that it's zero sum, but you know, one other thing that often happens is that the scientist doesn't feel that comfortable, right? So you know, scientists have this in our in many cultures. Uh, authority mode you know where they where their answers are taken and actually in, it's a longer conversation but often i think scientists have too much authority that they're allowed to speak on any subject you know even if they're not an expert and one of the things that the cafe does is that it's in a space where the audience feels comfortable and the scientist doesn't necessarily and it's a paradox but actually by reducing the scientist's power and stripping her of the things that normally give her authority uh, you you do empower the people around to take a more active role, and so I absolutely agree, Anna. That's that's a critical element, and it's quite countercultural, right? It's if it's done properly, it's quite radical. Mm -hmm. Well, I see you nodding there as well. Um, okay, I think if I would um, add something, it's um, just to buttress the um, fact the idea established. Um, that um, with science cafes, you can, um, unlike say or something, you you get to get feedback from your from the audience and also from the scientist who is you know, presenting or discussing. Yeah. 
set of findings so you can get yeah. no i think we're, we're 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 losing your signal a little bit wealth but i think we got some of that so 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 thank you um so um You've 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 given some beautiful descriptions as to what a, a science cafe is and how it actually differs this this informal setting. Um, um, what what are the benefits of doing this? So we've gone this way. We've got our our, our pub or our community center or or whatever. We've got some scientist who's prepared to uh, come in with a little bit of humility, and we've got an audience. Um, what are the benefits? What are the, what are the challenges um, in relation to increasing um, public understanding of science? So I think the main benefit. I'm always starting. I'm I'm always the first one. <laughs> but yeah, I think the uh, the benefit. The main benefit is giving back to people because uh, science. Um, all the work made in science is um, uh, it's funded by public funds so we are giving back to people um, the knowledge they allow us uh, to produce um, i think that's the main benefit and educate them uh, inform them what are we doing why are we doing that uh, that in that way um, and the main challenge is, is reaching out to people that are not familiar with uh, science. Um, so um, we always have a lot of, um, the majority of our audience uh, usually already has its ties or uh, is engaged with science in some kind, some way. Um, so reaching out to those who are furthest away from science, that's the main challenge. And for that, we have to go meet them. That's why we have this, this kind of events and we, we are part of this, right? Because we want to take scientists to go out and meet these people. But even though we do it, there's still um, a part of the, the population that we, we won't reach and we want to reach them because we know how important this work is uh, and how uh, empowering this is, uh, not just to one's life, but to, to, to everyone. This benefits a whole country, this benefits a whole society. Um, and other, one of the other uh, benefits that I would like to point out is usually scientists are, um, we are very used to communicate with our peers. So we use fancy words, we use jargon and everything. So uh, communicating to people outside of this uh, sphere is very important because uh, scientists also uh, have an opportunity here to train communicating to non-peers. And this is also very important. Uh, know how to keep it simple, uh, get it across the room uh, so everyone can understand uh, from the educated one to the 60-year-old um, person there that knows nothing about the topic. And we want to reach them on the same level. So uh, the language cannot be a barrier here. So another thing that I would like to point out, uh, point of uh, Pint of Science uh, Portugal, all sessions happen in Portuguese to take down this barrier, uh, this language barrier. This is very important that when we, when you are running a science cafe, you do it in your, in the language you speak in your country. That's very important. But yeah, th these are the main uh, ben benefits and the uh, challenges that I would like to point out. <laughs> Great. Uh, so, so, so I mean, well, look, I, I, Oh, sorry, Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, please. No, go ahead. I, I, I was uh, going to ask Wealth whether these are similar benefits that are seen in in Nigeria or other other challenges similar, or do you face different challenges given the given the context? Wealth also to answer about why how he keeps politics out of it from the questions. In well, the chat. yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was a good question. I saw that. Yeah. Okay, so um, so for to answer the question, I think I will use the context of our community science cafe. I already established initially that um, it's more of a, a kind of scientific community. So um, science and engage, public engagement and science communication work is basically um, 
what speaks out of the community to the public. So maybe on social media, and um, we've not really done so much of um, physical outreaches. So I, I think, um, but resting on some of the things that Anna already mentioned, um, um, I, I think one benefit, in addition to what um, sorry, um, Anna already mentioned, apart from benefiting the public, I think um, science cafes also have a way of benefiting the scientists or the speaker. So because uh, when you discuss science in informal settings, um, sometimes questions pop up, perspectives, individual perspectives that could make the scientists or make the individual to think differently about what they already knew about their research, because sometimes they are there, there is. I, I think like I feel like there's a way scientists are meant to think. Like you have the scientific method, so there's the, we have this kind of a, a kind of structured way to how we think. And different doesn't have a scientific background. We think so. Sometimes when you ask some questions, it wants to make you feel like, oh, is this really possible? So perhaps I should explore this further. So then I think a challenge. Um, Anna mentioned them um, using um the language I speak equivalent in your locality and Nigeria is really a diverse country. In fact, the, the whole of Africa is quite diverse. So uh, our cafe, we, we, we discuss in English, we all discussions in English, um, but we, I, I, I know when we, if we are going to, go, when we are going to go for physical outreaches, would um, try our best to use um, local parlance, say pidgin English to communicate or use the local languages of um, the, um, of our audience to communicate. But our using a local language, but perhaps the language that is prevalent in the particular uh, particular local setting. So, yeah. Of course, the mute is the biggest barrier to communication, Mike. Yes, <laughs> that's what I was about to say. Yeah, you, you, you would have thought after three years I'd be familiar with that, but uh, um, Anthony in the chat um, uh, noted that politics was uh, rife in, in Nigeria, like everywhere else. How do you keep politics out of um, uh, out, out of your conversations, Wealth? And then we'll move on to Daniel. OK, um, regards politics, uh, we, we do not um, engage so much in political discussions. So basically, we uh, when uh, when we meet, we let our members know okay, these are the kind of conversations that are allowed and these are the kind of conversations that are not allowed. But we, of course, we discuss about how government can inform scientific policies and whether um, the government in Nigeria or Africa are doing enough to you know, promote science, promote scientific research, but regards political, political discussions, parties, we don't, we don't delve into that in our setting. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. Daniel, Daniel. Well, what my old boss always used to, there's this idea of evidence into policy. So the idea that policy in, in in a national sense should be informed by evidence. But my old boss always used to talk about getting uh, policy into evidence. So actually, there is a value to having political discussions in the context of science, just I think in the way that both Anna and and wealth have spoken that it can inform the science and help to direct it but i probably want to quarrel with the terms of the question mike if i can uh, i'm yes. not sure that that cafe scientifico or whatever it's called is a very good method to increase public understanding right if there was a bunch of facts that you wanted to communicate to people about science then uh, you know, a, a, a well done PowerPoint or, you know, a powerful TikTok video is, is going to be much more effective. And you could test the number of scientific facts that people had at the end of it and at the beginning, uh, you know, and compare them and hope for a change. So I don't think, in, uh, you know, that, that that's what Cafe Sci is about. Cafe Sci is really about helping people to understand that their voice should be heard in a scientific conversation, that they are allowed to participate and uh you know that that n nature of that participation is really important and you know we've, we've, there's a couple of questions also in the chat about um uh scientists not being great communicators sometimes which you know again it's the old uh story about science communication oh you know if half of my colleagues were allowed to communicate with the public it would set scientific communication back 20 years you know so um <laughs> It's fine. The format works, right? If people don't understand, if you've built this cafe right, and if you have a confident facilitator, if people don't understand what the scientist is saying, they'll tell her. And actually, they'll jump in and help her to explain it better and give it in their own terms. And in, in the best cases, in the most magical cases, they'll just keep going till they understand it 
you know, and sometimes the scientist almost gets left behind. They have their, by the end, as Rolf says, they're taking notes. Oh yeah, that's right. That's probably the best way to describe it. I hadn't really thought of it that way. So the, the empowerment piece is very, is very powerful also for how science proceeds. Um, and, and the, the trust thing, which Muna on the chat was, was talking about, uh, mm. is, is, is really critical in this. I think I think the trust is an interesting question from Mona. Do 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 you find that um, trust does increase with these um, uh, between scientists and the public with this mode of, um, of of communication? Well, just if I can come straight back in, Mike, very quickly. Though in the UK we had this big thing about crisis of public trust in science, and there've been a lot of activities to think to try and change that. The critical piece that's usually missed out is that if you want the public to trust scientists, you have to work on getting scientists to trust the public. And most scientists don't trust the public. Um, many scientists don't believe in a free press, right? They'd rather that their work was not reported than that it was reported in a way that they don't agree with. And so getting scientists to trust the public more is one of the great benefits, I think, as Anna mentioned, of a cafe. When they come into this space, after a while, they realize that there is a huge amount of trust. You know, that scientists systematically underestimate public trust in science, which is what we would call in psychiatry paranoia, right? Scientists are paranoid about the public. <laughs> and opening to a space like cafe addresses the public, the scientists trust in the public, which is a critical part of, of the other thing. And I'll leave that to my colleagues on the call at Imperial to, to mull over that, that you're not very well trusted. Oh, we're not very well trusted. Um, what makes a good topic? We're running a science cafe. We've got our audience. Um, what makes for a good topic? Um, we've heard from Wealth that yeah, we can link this to everyday experiences. But but if you could characterize a good topic for for, for a science cafe, what would it be? Uh, I I think that's it. Uh, if 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 people can relate to it or um, uh, understand uh, how it impacts their lives every day, uh, but at the same time, if it's fun, <laughs> because science always has fun facts, right? So uh, being fun uh, is also one of the things that I would say would characterize a good topic would make a good topic um, and definitely uh, have an impact in people's life. First, have an impact in people's life. Um, and, and then on different levels, we, we can uh, inform and educate people into uh, some, many research uh, is being done that don't, don't have a direct impact in our lives, but will have someday. And explaining this to people is also very important. So, but that's on an, a different level. First, we really, we, we really need to connect with people and show them why is the sky blue? <laughs> you know, these kind of things that are so practical, so um, easy uh, and to relate with. That's uh, the main thing that makes a, a good topic. People can relate to it and um, know how to use it on their daily lives. Or uh, the, the knowledge uh, being um, uh, communicated or passed through the um, informal setting or the presentation needs to have uh, um, uh, people uh, can can look in the. <laughs> I don't know how to explain this more, but um, yeah, basically that's it. Uh, having um, an impact and uh, people can look around on their daily routines and see, oh, I was talking about this the other day. And, you know, <laughs> uh, that's right. it mainly. Okay, lovely. Daniel. I can't resist saying, Anna, that the reason why the sky is blue uh, was discovered <laughs> Uh, using this instrument here, <laughs> which is downstairs from where I'm sitting. So the fact that the sky is blue was discovered by John Tyndall in the Royal Institution in the last century. Anyway, a few centuries ago. Yeah, the yeah. best topics are the ones which, I mean, it's not a democracy, Mike, but it's the best topics, I think, are the ones that the audience chooses, right? I mean, it's it's not a democracy. Uh, so, you know, you need some cur curator, uh, curatorial direction, but uh, it's the ones that people are it's the ones that people care about. And sometimes you need to throw in the stuff they didn't know they cared about. But the, the, the model answer is that it's driven by the audience. Any any examples there, Daniel? You can give any really pertinent uh, or iconic examples you could give? Well, no, because you can, the thing of it is, 
suggest that you can do quantum physics. I mean, it doesn't matter, right? You can, there's, there, you know, there's nothing you can't discuss in Café Scientifique. Uh, so, you know, we've done, my favorite one that we did was about nuclear, when we were at the ICA, which some of you will know is, is right next to Parliament in London, we did about nuclear power. And the guy who we got as a speaker um, came in with a plastic bag uh, with him that he brought to the talk. And halfway through the talk, he, he reached down and picked up the plastic bag. And he said, and what I've got in this plastic bag is a is a fuel rod from a nuclear power station. He pulled out this metal object because <laughs> objects are kind of allowed even if slides aren't. And we were like, you are right by parliament, right? Did somebody, he says, well, like, it's one that wasn't actually ever put into the power station, but it is a fuel rod. So yeah, nuclear safety with an actual fuel rod was my favorite uh, topic. Brilliant, brilliant. And and wealth, what's it, what's it, what do you consider a good topic? Okay, so uh, I think I'm going to um, build upon what he said, but I'm also going to deviate a bit. I I feel um, in science, I'm also going to speak from our setting in Science Cafe. So I feel like um, beyond just thinking about the topic, like um, Daniel was trying to say, it's I think the presentation of the topic is even more important because you can have you could it's possible to have a very simplistic topic that the presentation is really poor and then the audience is not able to understand. But it's possible to talk about anything in the cafe, but um, the presentation, how how it's presented to the audience, I think that is something that um, that really should be um, that really matters. So um, for our cafe. Um, Usually members can decide on the topics they want to present on, uh, but sometimes we, we love trending issues. So if there's something that everyone is talking about, like um, the current chat GPT and um, its influence on how publications should be and all of that, we we are planning to have a conversation on that soon in our community. So sometimes trending topics because it's important that scientists are you know, up to speed with what's happening in the world and, you know, and if scientists are up to date, you know, that's when we can really educate the public and give them the right um, information. Then I would also add that um, there's also the whole idea of trying to debunk um, myths and misinformation. So I learned something recently um, from a science communication course that even it's even best sometimes to pre-bunk people. So prepare, the, prepare them ahead for myths you know, of, and of uh, misinformation before they even encounter it. So I feel sometimes it's also important for um, in cafe setting that you are able to discuss such topics that are prone to becoming myths or prone to giving rise to misinformation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting. Yeah. Um, so, 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 thank you. Um, let, let, let's just bring in a few of the questions from the chat because I think they, um, uh, they're, they're, they're related to the fourth question that I had, which was, what advice would you um, give to somebody looking to set one of these up? And a couple of questions is, how do you manage um, energy? Um, is this entrepreneurial? Um, you know, can you actually manage academics? I'm not quite sure about that. Um, so, <laughs> so, 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 what, what are the, what are the, uh, what tips and tricks? Somebody's going to set one up. What are you going to tell them? Um, Daniel, uh, find a bar. Um, so, <laughs> you, you, uh, the classic one. But I, I'd be curious with Anna because I know they have a slightly more commercial. Uh, um, uh, kind of head office approach in some respects of applying to science, but the classic cafe is you need a bunch of uh, like-minded people, you need a room above a pub, uh, you need a quiet evening where the pub is not going to make money from the room otherwise, you make an offer to the pub that you're going to take the room for no money, but they will get some beer sold uh, at that evening, uh, and then you print some flyers and you uh, get some folk. Ideally, you want a connection to a university because you want a ready supply of scientists. But again, it has to be clear that the benefit, you know, that the, the scientists are coming in order to help their careers, right? I mean, you know, they, they should be able to tick off doing this as part of their engagement requirements, which most universities and, and, and grants need. Um, and then you just invite people. Um, uh, if you need to get money, then generally you pass a hat round to pay for the tr speakers' travel expenses. But actually, speakers should, you know, from universities should be doing this as part of their jobs anyway. Um, uh, and then also, you need you need a facilitator. I think you need somebody who's prepared to tell the scientists to shut up, and uh, who's prepared to to encourage the people who are not confident uh, um, to speak. And and 
just to be clear on this, you know, we know very well from theory that public understanding of science doesn't equal public acceptance of science. And, it, you know, it, it's really important to challenge misinformation. So if we know things are incorrect, but also to respect people's right to say things that they believe in, in as long as they do it in a respectful manner. Uh, we know from fighting vaccine hesitancy, you know, which has been true as long as there have been vaccines. There's been people who've, who've hesitated since the first vaccine was invented. We need to find spaces where these people can express their anxieties and not be laughed at or ridiculed, um, as well as presenting them with what we with the science that we know can oppose it. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So, so, so maybe Anna, you can follow up. I, I agree with everything that Daniel just said. Um, uh, and um, what, uh, how to manage uh, a, a researcher or a scientist uh, in the during their own presentation? Well, we <laughs> that's that's tricky. But yeah, we need someone that knows out from the organization that will be there, like Marta is now was now <laughs> for a few minutes ago telling uh, we need to hurry up because we have a schedule. People are also here for another uh, presentation and would like to talk about that. So uh, we need to hurry up. Yeah, we need someone with uh, inside our own team that has, has the energy <laughs> to do that. Um, but at the same time, we want that the scientists um, present the work uh, as they as they want but we we prepare them we we ask them specifically uh, so we have this time it's okay five minutes it's okay but um, let's not uh, take things too long because people <laughs> want to hear more about other topics uh, and basically that's it that's what Daniel said we need someone in the room that uh, is prepared to tell a scientist when to shut up. <laughs> That's how you manage energy. <laughs> <laughs> and we're doing really well for time, so so thank you, panelists. Um, uh, uh, wealth. Um, what what tips and tricks would you give? Okay, so I I think if someone is thinking about starting a science cafe, I think I would ask the person first to start. Um, because sometimes we, we could become so bothered about the planning and the structure and all of that. So um, at the beginning, no, you may not have all of not all of those structures in place, but um, um, you, you basically will evolve or go into proper management sometimes over time. So um, regards managing a cafe, um, I, I think even though um, our setting is a bit different from, you know, because in our community we have um, majority of our committee members already have that science background and we have sometimes we do have um, non-scientists join us uh, but we we have similar uh, models in place like you have a moderator who oversees the entire conversation and sometimes we have to encourage people to ask questions because some persons are shy they don't like talking in public so I, I know that that also plays out in the physical science cafes where maybe audience do not have questions you have to maybe ex en encourage them and make them understand that this is for them and then they have to um, ask questions to get um, to get clarity. So um, I think um, another tip I should share is um, the need for flexibility. So um, there is no need to just you know like um, Daniel already mentioned initially that um, you know of, although there are structures, there are patterns to how a cafe should be run. You know, it's you, you are free to just explore, diverse, be creative with your own uh, style, with your own with how you want to operate your cafe. I think the most important thing is that the goal is reached and then members of the public who, who you know, engage with these communities or engage with your cafe, they get the benefit that they need, but be free with exploration, be free with flexibility and creativity. Great, great, thank you. Daniel. You just a couple of the questions about um, evaluation and success criteria, and which I think are really interesting. I mean, I'm a big fan of a thing called cultural capital or science capital, how much science is there in your life? And it goes back you know, like the cafe thing to a French concept of uh, habitus, um, you know, this idea of what do you bring to the table? And I do think that attending a, cafe, a science cafe, cafe scientifique can really change your view on that. And I think it's something that's worth researching within that context. The success criteria that I use, the, mo the single simplest success criterion for me for a cafe is what proportion of the people in the room spoke in the, in the open session, right? It's as simple as that. And really, for me, if you can get more than two thirds of the people in the room to speak uh, during the session success, 
right? It doesn't really matter what they say, it doesn't matter if it's relevant or not. Two thirds of the people speak, and we used to get that often with 60 people in the room. You'd have 40 voices would have been would have spoken, and that's really cool. The other one that's really helpful to do at the beginning is as a show of hands, who here, you know, you say if you've ever done any science at all, even at school, put your hand up. Everyone's hands go up. Okay, keep them up. Okay, keep your hand up if you've done a matriculation subject. Some hands go down. Keep it up if you have a degree. Most of the hands go down. Keep it up if you're an active scientist. Usually there's the speaker and one or two others. That's a really good criterion if the majority of the people, but there is this tendency to think that everyone else is an expert. So if you do that at the beginning and you see actually there's only two or three real experts, you know, professionals, then that's really empowering as well. But just getting people, getting people to speak and, you know, there's a ton of techniques. I'm sure Wealth and Anna have loads, but, you know, getting them to go into pairs quickly and then coming out. Just I, anyone who twitches, really, uh, you know, when I'm chairing, if you twitch, if you kind of go like that, I'll go, hey, wait, wait, wait. Why did you just go like that? It's generally much more interesting to hear from the person who kind of just went like that quietly than the person who's sitting there with the hand up. Mm -hmm. So again, really re reiterating the uh, the need for an expert facilitator um, there. So we've got we've got a couple of minutes left, and maybe I can um, and and we've got we've had some great questions in the in the chat, and I think we've we've done well to address some of them. Um, maybe I can just finish off with a question um, and and use my chair's prerogative. Um, so these seem brilliant. They seem a really good way to engage people who wouldn't necessarily necessarily um, be engaging with science um, or wouldn't necessarily um, have the um, ha have the privileges that we do um, to engage with science. So how do we scale this? May may maybe just a, a, a couple of minutes um, to, to, to give some ideas. How, how do we make this bigger? How do we make this bigger? You're sorry, Daniel, <laughs> you're about to speak as well. Um, you are referring to how can we uh, reach more people like uh, those who are furthest from science or? Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so bringing in people on the margins, um, a science cafe in every street. Yes, that, that would be amazing. <laughs> a science <laughs> cafe in every street. Um, how do we do that? Um, we have to continue to do our work and evaluate it and get the results of what we are doing. Uh, so evaluate if uh, the science cafe that we are running is uh, being su successful. Is it having an impact in people's life? And we know this by, for example, in Python science, it happens every year. So we, from, from year to year, we can uh, see if more people are coming um, so basically evaluating your uh, um, your science cafe and uh, get uh, include more topics uh, so not, not uh, talk about just biology or just chemistry include everything psychology um, uh, the more specific to the less specific um, everything because uh, you will always have people interested in different topics. Um, Great. So, so maybe I can just uh, ju just move this on, knowing that Martin yeah. will probably beat me if uh, I go beyond one o'clock. So, 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 wealth. Um, how are we going to do this? How are we going to make this really impactful and really enormous? Okay, I, I would say um, I would start with collaboration. That it's. Um, so to scale science cafes, um, there's need for collaborations. So um, first of all, I would say collaboration with members of the public because oftentimes we underestimate what members of the public can help us with. So um, if you are able to collaborate with the members of the public, it will be easier to scale it up. So maybe get more cafes for those who are thinking about you no know, actual physical cafes. Um, but I, I would also um, add that it's important to also explore alternatives. So the world is becoming really virtual now with COVID-19 and all of that. So I think it's also important and cool that we start exploring more virtual cafes. So even though it, it wouldn't have the same feel of the physical cafe, I feel, um, yeah, a time would come that would actually need more, more virtual. So I, I feel if we have, if a virtual cafes can actually help with scaling. So because, um, 
in physical cafes, you have people just within a locality, but if with virtual cafes, like what we do in our community, you have people from different locations and that can contribute to the perspectives, the experiences that are shared in the community. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and Daniel, a cafe from, from, from Cornwall to Scotland, how are we going to do it? Well, I mean, it happened, right? So, so Duncan, I mean, it's really paradoxical, yeah? Duncan, and, and you know, he went, I mean, so I was at Welcome Trust and we gave him a lot of money. Um, so money can, can kind of help, right? So you can get grants from people who are interested in democracy, um, uh, interested in participation. Uh, I mean, Wealth, I'm going to do Voltaire on you. You know, I'm, I disagree with what you say, but I'll defend your right to say it. Yeah, I'm not interested myself in the online cafes. I really love the physical viscerality of it. I think that participation in the flesh is worth a million times more than participation online. And But there are some elements that are quite interesting. So the chat piece, we're very familiar, I think, with working. I'm one of the older people here, but even with younger people than, than Wealth and Anna, uh, in a room, they'll often be really quiet, but then when you look on the chat, it's like, Bzzz. and so I think there will be ways of including the text-based chat into a physical environment and allowing somebody to bring those uh, voices forward. Um, but no, I think, uh, you know, we did try flying people, you know, we did international conferences, flying people in, and that can work for a while. Somebody asked in the chat earlier, how do you sustain it? Eh, no, you don't. I mean, you know, like three years, people burn out. Sometimes somebody takes it on. Sometimes they, it dies and comes to life again 100 meters down the road. Uh, I think it's got a natural participative organic cycle. But it is so exciting when it works. It's so powerful. It's so radical when, when, when the public really control the conversation. Uh, that spreading that excitement, sharing that joy, I think is the most powerful way. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, panellists. Uh, Anna Gomez from Pint of Science in Portugal, uh, Wealth Okati from Nigeria, and Daniel Glaser from the Royal Institution uh, here in London. Um, we've seen uh, a fabulous detailed description of what science cafes are. And um, I, I would say to my colleagues and everybody else uh, on the call, if we're really interested in communicating our science and making the public aware, um, and th those parts of the public who wouldn't necessarily have access to, to the science that, um, that, that we have, then science cafes would seem to be um, a fabulous and innovative way to, to go. So I would encourage everybody to set one up immediately. Um, uh, thank you to uh, Marta Cortese um, from Imperial, from the MSc in Science Communications for setting this up and um, managing us um, appropriately. And um, also to the Global Development Hub, the Global Development Hub um, is an initiative at Imperial that has been set up to build community of researchers um, uh, and other stakeholders um, in London, around the world, to bring our expertise to try to at least tackle some of the sustainable development goals um, and provide appropriate education. So thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, as you've seen in the chat, if you have follow up questions, um, you can you can email um, Myri on our team. So thank you very much.